Warhammer 40,000 Chaos Gate Demon Hunter has been out for a few days now, and in this video, we're going to go over the four base classes in the game. I'll start off by talking about how to determine what specialization your Grey Knight would thrive in, and then go into each of the classes. Demon Hunter is a very much a, you know, play your own way type of game. The game is filled with a lot of randomness, from the missions you take part in, to even the enemies that spawn in your missions, so no matter what, it's crucial that you play the game you want more than anything. Hopefully this video will act as a means of guiding you towards making the perfect extension of the Emperor's Wrath against the Ruinous Powers. I've broken this video up into chapters that you can quickly navigate to in the timeline and description so you can jump ahead to any part that interests you the most. And before we get started, if you intend on picking up Chaos Gate Demon Hunters and would like to support the channel, you can use the link to my Nexus store in the description and pinned comment. Nexus works directly with the developer, getting Steam keys to you while also giving me a cut of every sale that helps keep the channel alive. Also, if you end up enjoying the video, please don't forget to do the usual shebang, like, comment, and subscribe. I cannot tell you how much it helps. Let's dive in on the class guide for Chaos Gate Demon Hunter. To open us up, I want to have a conversation about talents. Now, the game doesn't necessarily hide this information, but it also doesn't necessarily point it out to you. So every single Grey Knight that you recruit, if you go into abilities and you hover over their main class icon, it'll show you a talent that appears below their actual class title. This will also file in with any kind of augmentics that you get as you progress through the campaign. They become critically wounded and you have the augmentics upgrade that would grant them a benefit from it. Sometimes, sometimes you can see this in the passive abilities portion. You'll see Cult Bane down here as talent. This knight has 10% crit for all melee and ranged attacks against organic enemies. Now, the reason I'm bringing this up is it can be, you can use these talents sort of as a barometer of what style of character this Grey Knight can be. Maybe you've got five apothecaries. And this guy in specific has gone heavily into healing and maybe you know you don't really know what you want another apothecary to be it is worthwhile to have multiple roles of a specific class in mind because if one gets wounded you're going to want to have another apothecary healer you don't want to just simply specialize and silo yourself to just having three apothecaries one's a healer one's a biomancer and one's a damage dealer it's just not going to work that way so the talents at least give you an indication of a direction that you can affix to each one of your characters outside of maybe a specific role you have in mind another good example of this would be again going back on apothecary i had four apothecaries and two of them were healers and i'm like well okay i at this point i've got enough healers that i can cycle around i should start using um uh, an apothecary to actually kind of be more of a combat support character so you figure out the roles you want to have for your classes based more upon their talents and how many you already have fitting a specific specialization before you kind of just go crazy across the board this was a conversation i just wanted to have up front about the characters before going into their individual classes as i feel like this is kind of a an overall ethos to apply to all four of them when you're trying to build out your great knights also another note before we dive into the character classes is the ability to commune now this says stasis chamber required commune with your fallen brothers to earn additional ability points or reset and choose new abilities this will not be active for you until something happens in the game you're probably wondering to yourself what is that I personally do not know yet. I just know this is the only way you can reset your ability points. I've just not gotten to the point in which you can do it. So it seems to be locked behind a research, which I have the stasis chamber. Um, let's just take a look at that. And it also seems to be research or locked behind a point in the game. So I already have the actual apothecarian. We can store the, uh, the stasis chamber here. We can store your uh, fallen battle brothers. So you need to actually upgrade for certain portions of it and reach a story point to be able to commune with your fallen battle brothers. So if you wanted to respec, you can. Uh, it's just not available until you get to that point oh, in no. your campaign. To start off, we're going to go into the Justicar, probably my favorite of the four base classes and the tankiest of the four base classes until you unlock the Paladin. I'm going to go ahead and click Abilities here and let's take a look at what we've got. So it's worth noting that the Justicar and the Apothecary are the only two base classes that can take advantage of Terminator armor. The difference between Terminator and Power armor is that Terminator armor typically has innate health and armor benefits right at the start at Tier 1, but you cannot scale walls you cannot jump over precipices that is what power armor will allow you to do so you, you sacrifice mobility for increased armor basically so taking a look at the four disciplines here for the justicar the way to kind of look at this is everything to the left and the right 
is more focused more on doing outright damage versus the top and the bottom are focused with fo focused on utility and tanking. That's I think a good way to kind of break up this uh, skill tree as it were. So I think no matter what, no matter how you specialize your Justicar, the most important skill or ability here is honor the chapter. Choose a knight at any range, they gain one AP. And that is huge. You give them one additional action point, upgrade it to give them an additional additional action point so they get two now, it's great. Then you can warp charge it to give them a total of four action points and one willpower. It is such a good return. It really allows for one knight to almost get an entire new turn. Of course, you know, sans willpower. Uh, and it's a great way to just do a ton more damage, say, in a big boss fight. Or if you're trying to slog through the early endurance portion of a mission that leads to a boss fight, this is really, really, really crucial. I really like this ability. And if we're sticking in this whole um, utility portion of the south, um, the crushing charge ability is nice it's not an auto pick for me but what i like about it is you spend one ap and you move double your effective movement range because it says uh run in a single direction up to range 10. your current move is five on this character as you can see so it's not an auto pick because i think the two willpower is a steep is a steep cost for this when i'd rather use maybe say willpower for this or hammer hand or rend the unclean so it's great Mobility, and if you do struggle with mobility on your Justicar, then definitely choose Crushing Charge. You have that ability to move around the map very quickly. I just find that there's better uh, use cases elsewhere for those points. Now, I want to go over here to the right because this is, I think, a portion of the Justicar tree that has slept on. And I think it's, it's really good at the current point in the game. And that is mainly the Psy Cannon. The Psy Cannon is a really strong ranged weapon i think in personal opinion uh, as far as the four base classes go it's the strongest ranged weapon um because of the ability to do a lot of damage in an area effect and the silencer is currently bugged so the psi cannon allows you just to do so much raw damage on a character that is going to be up close and personal anyway you you overcharge it and or i'm sorry <laughs> overcharge it, yeah i'll go with that you charge it and use psychic onslaught and you can do a ton of damage aoe to anyone even if they're within cover so it negates that cover and does a lot of good damage in addition to you can do rapid reload so he'll have a 50 50 chance when he reaches zero ammo to just outright reload so it's a great um ability uh, auto ability to strap on with psi cannon so i really like these two for me i i've just recently built out a just a car with it and now they've become an auto pick for me because they're just so strong moving over to the left side We'll take a look at Hammer Hand, which is a very crucial ability here because it is a 100% 10 or 110% chance of crit hit. So it almost always guarantees a crit hit on something, especially a boss. And this is going to be crucial too because bosses you want to shut down abilities. So picking up Hammer Hand is absolutely a must because if you're going down this route, you probably want to get up to this ability, Ren the Unclean. So while Hammerhand is good to do the crit damage, Ren the Unclean is where the Justicar can really pour out a lot of damage in an AoE shot. Because its base damage is 6, and it does a stun. Or I'm sorry, a knockback. But then you can upgrade it to do a base damage of 8. Then you can warp charge it with this warp charge upgrade to then do a base damage of 10 plus 1 blast area. So 3 blast area. And that is a huge AoE effect for the Justicar. And it really is... A strong ability because I've I've been in situations where against a boss I'll use hammer hand and then use Ren the Unclean because it just does more damage than my actual uh, strike my actual force strike melee attack so Ren the Unclean is a really good ability too because you get like I said that raw damage outputted that you're not relying on any kind of crit damage or anything like that and in addition to it you can hit anything else around it I really like it one thing to note with all of these classes, there's going to be times you have to you can pick up max willpower increase passive abilities. Gauge this based off of the amount of abilities you're going to be using on this character. Take a look at this guy right now. He's got one, two, three, well, I guess four, but that, that's not that's not a willpower ability. So three big abilities. I'm definitely going to want to pick up one of these in addition to any armor that's going to increase his willpower. That is going to be crucial here for any class that utilizes it. But maybe you have a Purgator who doesn't have a ton of actual abilities. Maybe you're just using Psychic Onslaught a lot, whatever it is. Then maybe you can kind of curtail back spending the ability point on willpower. So, so keep that in mind when you are, are navigating through that. This most uh, south portion here, the melee discipline 
I actually don't find as crucial for the Justicar. If I was, say, playing uh, on an Interceptor, I would find it a little more useful. I'd rather use the willpower to, say, honor the chapter, um, hammer hand someone, or rem the unclean. Force Strike is, of course, great, and you can buff it here to do a lot of armor break, which is awesome, meaning that the armor will not regenerate, right? So armor penetration will go through the armor. Armor break will remove the armor. Two big cru uh, crucial differences there. And I, Ruthless Precision, while nice, I don't really find it as um, as useful as some of the other abilities in the uh, Justicar tree. Of course, being the last area here is the Age of Shield Discipline. So this is if you want to make your guy a tank. If you want to have him really be buffing up his own armor. So you would use this. Age of Shield is going to increase his armor by one. This one will also increase his armor by one. Then Warp Charge will increase it by an additional three. So if you take a look at that, that is eight total armor from just one cast of Age of Shield, which is very nice. But then you get this ability, Fortress. So you can then take your armor... All the armor points you have accrued. So if I were to have a fully buffed up Aegis Shield plus my current Terminator armor, that would be 10 armor. I would be throwing that armor then onto another knight for 10 turns. And the nice thing is this is target a knight at any range. So if you do want to make this guy a defender, a true kind of prototypical RPG paladin of, of defending other characters, and not to mention there's an actual class called paladin, uh, then this is the way to go. Because you can throw a whole bunch of armor onto that character. If they're surrounded, they're about to get a beat down the next turn. You can mitigate a lot of that damage. You can also mitigate that damage by taking it yourself using provoke. Choose a target within 10 range. Afflict enrage. Afflicted target will attempt to melee attack the source of the affliction. So this can be a way to pull a lot of people in towards you and fight you as well as also you get uh, this ability to give them crazed so they'll actually also attack themselves, so they have a chance to attack themselves. So this kind of breaks down the Justicar talent tree. Again, my big auto picks here are going to be the Psy Cannon upgrade, just to give you some range utility while you're already up close and personal, and then going into Honor the Chapter. And from there, I would make the decision, do I want to make a tankier Justicar? Well, then I'm going to go up here into this route. I'm going to go for Fortress first and foremost, because then I can throw my shield onto people. But um, if I want to go for more of a melee route, I definitely want to get to Rem the Unclean as fast as possible and specialize heavily into that. Then from there, you can kind of add stuff like uh, Bleed to your Hammer Hand, stuff like that. But hopefully this gives you a better idea on how to build out your Justicar. And, and one thing to note, too, is, like I said, still really make sure you look at that talent tree. Resilient here, this guy kind of makes a little bit more sense as a tank. So build him as a tank if you want. You don't need to. I'm just saying like that talent kind of gives you an idea of how to build out your character if you're struggling for, I don't know what to do. This can kind of give you that little context clue. When it comes to weapons for my Justicar, I like to really focus on Force Swords and Demon Hammers, and that's really just a personal preference. Go with whatever really makes the most sense for you and what you're actually getting the most loot of. I have like zero halberds, as you can see, so there's no real e reason for me to focus on them. But I have, for example, this Force Sword that will work really well with a couple things I'll just show off. So the Sword of Days here has a 50% chance to parry and first strike. Well, if you take a look at these values, it's actually 80% for me, also for my rapid reload, because this character has lightning reflexes, 10% focus, which was increased that chance to have autos kick off. Then I'm also using the Sanctic Shard, which will add an additional 20%. So this is an example of some way to take the talent that your character has, lightning reflexes being a talent, and capitalizing on it. I'm giving him a really good sword. In fact, I think it's my best sword, to be totally honest, um, that also grants him parry and first strike. And because of his lightning reflexes, he is going to trip that off very easily. But for weapons, again, go with whatever makes the most sense for your loot. I think this is something that's very true of almost every single class in the game. Go with what makes sense, obviously. If it's class restricted, it's class restricted. Like, if, if you don't have a... Um, a chaplain, then you won't be using a Crozius Arcanum. Um, so I, I, I'm not going to do a breakdown for every single class on what weapon to use, um, because I think, like I said, it is a very much a personal choice, and it's dependent upon the ammo, I'm sorry, the, the loot that you do get. But I did want to make this distinction here to kind of further drive that point home about talents, <clears throat> but also talk about the melee weapons here for the Justicar. Next up, let's talk about the Interceptor, another really strong class that I think takes a little time to get going, but once it does, it really 
really, really shines and becomes a super clutch class. So as with all the other classes, you have your disciplines all spread up, but the big crucial one for the interceptor is teleport. It's the mainstay in the tabletop. It's why you pick interceptors and it is the biggest boon to use one because they have got so much mobility. So just the base value here gives you an ability to move a range of 10 and you can upgrade it to also swap positions with a current knight. So that's a lot of really good utility again to just get really mobile. But really what we're focusing on is teleport strike. Before we talk about teleport strike, I want to just tell you, make sure you pick up as many of these willpower increase abilities because teleport strike costs three willpower on its own. Warp charge it to cost four warp willpower, but it's so useful that you can just do a serious amount of damage. So you're teleporting that range 10 that you got here, right? Um, from uh, teleport, but you're also going to deal five damage to all targets. And you do damage in a, in a smaller and smaller circle with each target. So you can't make massive, massive jumps. But you can, st if it's all in a level field, there's no cover in their way, there's no Z axis, like there's no one below them or above them, then you do, a, you can jump to a lot of targets and you can do a ton of damage because you can upgrade this to do a base damage with warp charge, I'm sorry, with warp charge of eight. That's crucial because then you put teleport boost on this and the knight can actually regain one AP. So you basically get to do this for one free action point 50% of the time, assuming you've got nothing that'll boost your focus, which is that little 50% icon. This would increase your autos and your um, affliction ability. Um, I, it, it's such a, you could choose nothing else and this would be, amazing right this character would just be such a damage dealer but there's another route we're going to talk about to really do a ton of damage and that's on the right side of the, of the field here but let's keep going on this left side before we jump over there the other big one in this location is support fire you're going to find that the interceptor is in harm's way more often than not and they're going to be in the weapon range of anything that you're shooting at from your back line with your purgators your apothecary hell even your justicars so support fire is great because it adds base damage to what they're doing so if it support fire here at at just a base value is two damage you can add an additional five across both upgrades so focusing on this just even one point into here is just a great way to get utility damage because it's a 100 percent auto ability it is going to kick off and that is a really good thing because you're just you're not relying on the, the the off chance that it happens it's damage you can count on at the beginning of a turn right because auto abilities only happen once per turn unless you do enduring reflexes which would increase that use by one um for teleport and teleport strike their psychic abilities their psychic boons so they would use your psychic ability for that turn so you can't you can't teleport multiple times and get multiple action points so just want to kind of clear that up so outside of this left side we have this one up here psychic suppression now by and large, this isn't necessarily a amazing ability at the beginning of the game. You're going to think, well, I'm not really, a, I encounter maybe the rare Psyker in the Psyker cult, Cultist or whatever it is. But when you go to do any actual fight, um, any boss fight, anything like that, Psychic Suppression is a must. It just gives you an extra turn to close the gap and shut down an ability or just stop you from being harassed by a um, Psychic ability because Silence for one turn is great, but now you can make it for two turns and then you can make it for three turns. And the nice thing about those is you're not going to warp charge it to increase that silence. So I think that the, you should always have an interceptor kitted out with a full psychic suppression load. And that sounds really wild if I say it out loud. But that enables you to have a character that's really that's really going to be good at, at shutting down psychers. And it's crucial because this is going to buy you three turns of silence. It's nice. It's good. Definitely rely upon it because when you start to get into your first boss fight, you're really going to see how you really wish you could shut down some of those psychic abilities. And even though the Interceptor is a range class, you know, don't sleep on uh, upgrading his range damage. It's surprising how well it can it can really help you out. This is, of course, Cybolt, so you're not doing a raw damage increase here, but just, just a quick little note. Moving down to this uh, lower portion, 
We get some utility with Aegis Shield. This can be nice. Uh, the nice thing about it, of course, is just you're making, you're giving him more survivability. If he is out in a situation where he's far away from his other battle brothers and he needs a little aid, Aegis Shield can give him that little boost. So go with this if you so wish. But the big thing here, though, is getting an extra war gear slot. Here's how I've I've used that on this character. Um, oh, that's not this character. Whoopsies. Here we'll go to this other guy over here. This character right here. So. This character has these Falchions, which have a good uh, percent chance to crit, right? Well, this adds two crit damage, and this adds two crit damage, and 15% to crit. So getting two war gear slot items is actually very nice if you stack up crit damage or whatever you want to stack up. It's just a great way to really utilize the punching power of the, uh, the Interceptor. I think I actually had these on that guy, and it had a total of six total crit damage or whatever it was so you can get kind of wild with uh, stacking up crit damage and crit chance so the war gear slot here is actually very good to really really boost this guy's damage potential speaking of damage potential let's go into hammer hand we talked about it before it's that guaranteed crit chance you're gonna want it because this allows you to teleport him right up next to a boss shut down an ability and then maybe even psychic suppression that boss as well so it, they kind of one run hand in hand, but if you're stacking up crit damage like you just saw me doing, then hammer hand can just explode things left and right. Like I was using that other uh, interceptor I showed you just a second ago, and <laughs> he was just wading through everything. Nothing stood a chance. I would just one shot the uh, mephitic launchers, like just crazy. I, I love the amount of abilities that you can stack into these characters if you really specialize them with war gear um, and master crafted weapons and armor. Going through the rest of this, though, you get abilities to buff up this. Um, I actually don't find bleed to be as crucial. Um, I might be proved wrong here by someone in the comments. By all means, let me know. Uh, but I'd rather just get an additional crit damage on this. And again, get, the, get that willpower. This character is a willpower sink if you're using a bunch of teleport abilities. With this top line, we're going to be getting a lot of bonuses to crit, percent, and to damage. So if I was going to, say, build this character out exclusively to do melee damage... I would start going over here to get the teleport ability because that utility is so nice. And then I would go immediately into this to build out my crit percentage and my damage. Because the big thing about these three right here is, again, this is not linked to the warp charge. I'm not going to have to charge up my melee attack. It's just flat percentage increases. So in total, I'm going to get 15% chance to, increase, or to crit more and two more crit damage. In addition, Ruthless Precision here, um, when this knight crits a target with a melee attack, they have a 50% chance to gain 1 AP. That, I think, is really good, as opposed to the Justicar's one, which is when another knight crits and they're in range, then they get AP. Uh, this is just, I'm going to be getting a lot of value out of this one for this character, and I, I just want to focus on getting Ruthless Precision, especially if I've got this, which is going to trip that off multiple times in a round. Going to this bottom portion, we get Cleansing Strike, which again will be really nice when you are dealing with any kind of um, boss or you're dealing with a specific type of strong character in a mission because this has Purge. When afflicted, the target loses all their mutations. And when you're dealing with a boss, you'll typically be dealing in a mission that has high um, corruption, meaning a lot of warp surging, and a lot of warp surging will mean a lot of corruptions. Uh, I'm sorry, a lot of mutations. Cleansing Strike can mitigate that. But personally, while this is a very good ability, I would focus on hammer hand, crit damage increase, and teleport more over than anything. And again, I guess on that note, to recap, focus on getting to teleport strike. Maybe pick that up right before you jump over to the right side of the tree. Decide if you want to make this character a psychic suppression character. And then I would say focus on these abilities here to make this guy a critting machine. Also, I, I would definitely pick up this war gear slot. So, um... You can do the Psychic Suppression for all of them if you want, or just focus on ones for specific bosses, whatever you so wish. But that is how I would build out my Interceptor. And for weapons too, I, I almost exclusively only do Falchions on them because of the crit chance increase that, that Falchions typically have. Typically have. They usually have a higher crit chance on them, so that's why I went with them. Also, they look goddamn cool. Uh, Demon Hammers though, I mean, you can do whatever you want. Like I've always said, like I keep saying, it's up to your playthrough. How, what loot are you getting? What fits for you? I've heard that warding staves are actually really, really solid because you get the ability to get um, the uh, uh, Aegis reaction here. But again, go with what loot you've got and build out the Interceptor the way you want to. All right, now it's time to talk about the Purgatory. And this is a class that I 
hated it at the start of the game. I couldn't find a use for it. It didn't feel right. It didn't feel good. I, I just was really struggling with it. So we're going to go through the ranged weapons first for this class because I think this is an actual pretty pertinent thing since that's the only thing you really be focusing on with him. Sure, you can throw a, a melee weapon and a storm bolter on him if you so wish, but that's not really why you use this guy. So for one, I never touch the incinerator. Uh, Flames of Purity and Promethium Spray, they can be cool in certain scenarios, but Personally, I just don't ever really use them. And this isn't the tabletop where I need Overwatch shots to hit. So I go with the Silencer or the Psy Cannon. Now, the Silencer is unfortunately bugged right now. So I would not use the Silencer. But it does have a good benefit in the Disrupt shot. Disrupted will disable any other enemy that is, say, pinning, like suppressing down one of your knights by constantly shooting at them, or Overwatching. So Disrupted would knock that off, or any kind of channeling ability for that matter. So having that is nice. Personally, I'd rather just knock them back with a charge, with a grenade, with outright killing them. There's so many other ways you can disrupt someone that having the ranged ability to do it at 14 range is really nice. But again, personally, I'd rather go with the Psy Cannon. And I don't even have, for this uh, uh, playthrough right here, any of the special Psy Cannons unlocked. And it is still stupid strong. It is Psychic Onslaught is a great ability because it activated to add a blast over two er, or area two that deals four damage, no stun, meaning it doesn't add to the stun counter, but it ignores cover. So it will hit everyone. And it is really, really strong once buffed up. So my side the side cannon is how I choose or what I choose for this character. And that is gonna give you an idea of how I buff out the abilities. Uh, with the silencer up here, I'm not gonna be focusing on that. So the big crucial choice here is to go, for my in my personal opinion, to go to the left. Uh, you can use the uh, upgrade here for storm bolters, but you're not. I'm not going to be focusing on it. You just need it to get over into this direction, which then allows you to increase your ammo and crit damage. That is going to be very, very nice. And a really nice auto ability here is return fire. So when shot by an enemy, this knight has a 50% chance to shoot back automati automatically. It happens way more often than you would think. And especially because that knight's kind of in the back line, maybe he's going to get attacked by something that warps in from behind you. It just gives him some nice utility to actually get some shots back. And I really, really, really like it. I, it, it, I didn't think I'd like it as much as I did. I, I bought it just like, oh, I'll see how this works. And just to kind of get an extra shot on was great. Because then as I go down here, whew, things get really wild. So with the uh, Psychic Onslaught, we can buff the hell out of it. So I can make it so that it will now do an additional two damage on top of the damage that it does. And then it will now do one more area. That is so nice. But then there's this other nice little auto ability in this section, rapid reload. When this knight's ammo reaches zero, they have a 50% chance to reload automatically. I just, honestly, this guy could stay as is, like I've said for the Interceptor, and he'd be just fine because the ability that Psychic Onslaught allows you to do damage through cover is huge. You can, in that area increase, you can wipe, wipe out an entire early wave of just bullshit cultists or little uh, plague monkeys, not bears, little guys. <laughs> uh, poxwalkers, poxwalkers. <laughs> With one overcharge here, and I, and I love it. I, I really do think that the... Um, the Psy Cannon uh, on both the Justicar and the Purgatory is such a strong ability. Now moving up here to the north side, I, I would definitely pick up this plus one ammo because more ammo on this character is always crucial. I pretty much only use the armor that increases his uh, his ammo. I don't think it's... Yeah, I don't... It's not here. It's in... That, that armor only... I've got better armor, but this gives him one, uh, one ammo and it helps out with range, so that's why he uses it. Um, also, it's power armor, so we can get around. He's very mobile. Again, I don't really focus on anything here in the silencer uh, arena. Support fire is actually very, very good. I just don't want to spend the points to go into it. When an enemy is shot within this knight's weapon range, you've already seen this before with two other classes, they'll do the plus two to the damage of the target. Um, I just didn't want to spend the points over here. I'd rather go over into some of these other things, which we'll talk about. So moving to the south, <clears throat> we get Astral Aim, uh, which allows you to shoot at range 10 to deal 5 damage and also gives precision targeting. So this is actually a very nice ability, and I think it's actually one that I have slept on with more of my purgators than I wanted to, and I've tried it out recently, and I actually really like it because it is hammer hand for a ranged weapon. 100% crit. Precision targeting means I get to shoot off a body part or shut down an ability, so it is really nice. Also, I can 
do this, warp charger to armor piercing and just completely bypass armor. So if I've souped up my weapon, my range weapon damage already, then this is a really great way to get a lot of great utility out of it, especially with a crit damage increase. And also mental focus here is nice because it's a 50-50 that if I use astral aim, I'll get the AP that I've just spent on it refunded back to me. That is lovely. So again, just like we've seen with stuff like the teleport strike, um, mental focus is even on the uh, the interceptor, right? They've got an ability that allows them to swap out or uh, get the uh, a 50-50 AP back if they do a crit. So you can use that with hammer hand in conjunction. I don't think I mentioned that in the interceptor section. But to the top side, we get Emperor's Light. So this is a cool one here because it is a little bit of a support ability here. It's going to blind things and it's also going to purge, which is nice. This is going to remove any and all mutations on something. But it is a 50-50 until you buff it with this Warp Charge ability. So that is kind of sucks if it was a if it was the ability to increase the purge natively up to 100%. It could be nicer um, with maybe a different Warp Charge. So Emperor's Light. It's blinded, so they reduce two damage with their ranged attacks. I personally haven't found ranged attacks to be as punishing as the melee attacks in this game. I do know that that changes, though. There are definitely situations where you will deal with some very punishing ranged attacks, but not to the point where I was thinking to myself, damn, I really wish I had Emperor's Light right now. No, with the Purgator, I'd rather have Psychic Onslaught online harder or a really good Astral Aim buff up to then go down um, Emperor's Light. There's other ways I could reduce... Uh, a range weapons capabilities by simply just being in cover so it does it does help in certain situations but i think a lot of those situations are well situational so moving into the other side we get sanctified kill zone which is actually a very strong ability and gives purgator a really nice utility in that back line because this grants vulnerable afflicted targets suffer two damage from all attacks ranged and melee so this allow and it's got a good range to of 10 so you can cast this have the rest of your knights do their turn and do a ton more damage just by getting this little bonus here. And you can increase it to have it last for an extra turn. You can also armor break things too. So if you're dealing with a lot of death guard and they all have like innate, I think either two or three armor, you can warp charge this, break all their armor, and you're good to go. Because remember, armor penetration bypasses armor. Armor break removes that armor, so that way you don't have to deal with it. So this is a really nice little ditty right here. Also, you get Enduring Reflexes once again for an additional use on your um, auto abilities. This will be actually really nice if you've already picked up Mental Focus and or Return Fire. Also, Support Fire would, would, get, would gain a benefit from this. So this is something not something I would focus on, but it's something that I would get after I've picked up more auto abilities. So... I definitely think Sanctified Kill Zone is a really strong pickup depending upon how you want your Purgator to be. Do you want him to focus on really getting crit shots in or do you want him to be support first and foremost? Uh, personally, <clears throat> I think going down this is, is crucial first and then just make that decision for yourself. Do I want him to really jump, jump in on those chunking out critical hits or just jump into some support? You could even do a point here and a point here if you wanted. Just... My opinion, though, is specialize into one tree over the other and then go into the, uh, yeah, <laughs> one tree over the other, then go into the other one. <laughs> Whichever one you didn't choose is a better, better way of saying it. Now, this other branch up here is specifically for grenades. It has an extra war gear slot to just equip grenades, which is always really nice. And you can increase the ammo of your grenades, which is cool, and then the, the area. Personally, for me, when it comes to spending requisition, grenades are one of the lowest things on the totem pole for me. I, I, in fact, when it actual comes to the report for the Grand Master, I'd rather spend the points on the requisition for more Grey Knights because you get advanced classes faster because you have to hit a mission point. Uh, you have to hit an actual story mission to get your advanced classes, but getting more... Um, uh, 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 knights available to you is always really, really important. And I like having better weapons, better range uh, attack, and better armor before I want to go into war gear. So my personal choice is to not focus on grenades. If I had more characters like this guy who has the talent, this, uh, this knight gains five range for their equipped grenades, I would focus more on the grenades for my purgators, but I, none of my purgators have that ability. So grenades to me aren't a crucial choice. This is another example of how talents can help morph how you build out your character. Then the last line here is arcane weapons. I personally don't find a huge benefit from this because I'd rather just use the willpower and the AP to do more psychic onslaughts, to do more um, 
astral aims or more sanctified kill zones. So let's, the way this works here is it's a psychic boon. So you're taking your psychic ability away for that turn. Depletes all ammo. Target a knight at any range who gains plus one damage per two ammo for the next range attack. This works if you've got two purgators or if you've got a, pur a purifier and a purgator. Just an ability to buff up someone else's range attack. Well, honestly, if I'm bringing in a purgator, that's my ranged character. My apothecary will oftentimes have ranged attached onto his stormbolter, but he's a healer or a, a support character, not so much a ranged character. So arcane weapons to me is not very useful because I personally do not plan on bringing multiple uh, ranged characters. Now, if I had no more points to really invest in other areas, I would jump down here for that max uh, willpower more than anything. That's what I would get the, the bonus out of this tree. But that's how I would build out my Purgator. Let's jump into the last class, the Apothecary. Last but not least is, like I said, the Apothecary. Now you would think this is the class that is the most obvious one to build out. But truly, once you kind of really look at the ability tree, you'll find that you can get pretty confused pretty quickly. So let's just go through this again. Apothecary is the last class and the only other class to have the Terminator armor of the four base classes. Now, what most people are going to do with their apothecary is go over here. Just go down the battlefield medicine and start giving the bonuses to health. Don't make that mistake for all of your apothecaries. Let me just say that up front. Because look at what it says for battlefield medicine. Narthesium only. So if he does not have the Narthesium equipped, then he cannot get any of the benefits from these three talent points or ability points you've spent. So... Unless your character guaranteed will have an Arthesium, don't spend the points here. Um, and I've realized here that, I mean, honestly, sometimes you kind of need to if you want to get down here for the melee ones. So you need to go down that route. But um, I have realized more and more that a non-healing apothecary is actually stupid strong. And we're going to get into it with the biomancy in just a little bit here. But don't feel like you have to use all of these healing abilities. It's not necessarily going to be the thing that makes or breaks your apothecary. But this northern portion, this little, I don't even call it north and south, the whole entire video, I don't know what the hell I'm doing anymore. But the servo skulls are actually stupid strong because when we look at servo skulls, they only cost ammo. They do not cost action points. That is a huge boon because as long as you've not spent all the action points on that character, on that Grey Knight, you can use as many servo skulls as they've got. So use them. Uh, an example would be I have a Medikai skull on this guy, but I have a Medikai skull and an Extractor skull on another character. I can use both those skulls at the same time on the same turn as long as he has that one action point remaining because as soon as you go down to zero, you can't do anything with that character. But this gives you a war gear slot exclusively for servo skulls, which is very nice, and it increases their ammo. This ability here, though, the Apothecarian Skull, is going to be very, very crucial once we talk about biomancies. But it makes this entire left side of the uh, Apothecary tree have their range be any versus 10, I think is this one, uh, within range 1, within 1 range within one range. So 10 was nowhere near what it, what it actually is, but this is crucial if you want to make a support apothecary. Absolutely 100% crucial because also server skulls are very supporty. Now, the bottom portion of this is if you do want to go down a more melee-centric apothecary, you don't want to use an Arthesium. And honestly, they do a good job because they are, they are strapped with Terminator armor. And as you go into some of the Biomancy stuff, they actually do a really good job with this. And while I do not use bleed, I'm sure someone is going to make a really cool apothecary build on the internet. It's going to be like the vampire apothecary, something like that, where you stack up bleed because this is the character that can really do it. You use this, you make it so that your four strike puts bleed on things. This will put bleed on things with your, with your bolter. And then you can use these to add more bleed to things. So bleeding for the apothecary is actually somewhat useful because you can buff bleeding. Other classes can just simply strap it on. So this is where you can really shine with bleeding if you so wish, but this is also where you'll be getting your damage for your melee weapons with your um, with your uh, apothecary. Um, now, on top of that, we have another super crucial ability for the apothecary, and it is the Emperor's Judgment. And... I think if you're going with a healer apothecary, 
picking up the Emperor's Judgment is an, is an auto ch an auto pick. Even if you're going with a Biomancer Apothecary, I still think it's an auto pick because as a Psychic Blast, area of four at range 15, afflict hobbled. So they remove it minus two. But you can warp charge this to lock everyone down and immobilize them for two whole turns. That is lovely. Like, I really like this ability, especially because you can increase the area up to five. And it also comes with a willpower in this bottom tree in the Emperor's Judgment Discipline. I think this is a really, 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 really strong pick because it allows the rest of your knights to get in much better position to do a lot more damage or get out of really sticky positions. It's a really good way to support the team just in the same way that healing is. So I find this to be very, very useful. Now, the last tree over, or the northern tree, again, north-south thing I keep doing, is uh, the Scouring, which will afflict bleed onto the targets bleed does two damage a turn and ability plus one area plus one i'm sorry the area can increase by two in total up to four and then you get this grim surgeon all bleed afflictions caused by the apothecary last for three turns or three more turns that's five turns on your cybolt shots on your um uh, four strikes. So this is what I mean by bleed for pretty much everyone else doesn't really ap appeal to me But for the apothecary it can be stupid because if you think about it You put bleed on a character that can bleed mechanicals cannot bleed um, Then they're gonna be taking if we look at this character um, an additional What is this two, two times uh, five? So that's ten damage across five turns well a total of ten damage across five turns so it's a really nice way to put just a ton of damage on something that'll gradually tick off on them. And those things can be very crucial in a game that is like this, that is turn-based. But like I've said now three times, it really shines with the Apothecary who can just really buff up that chance to bleed. And you'll find other ways to add bleeding or to increase bleeding with weapons and armor. I'm sorry, weapons and... Uh, with melee and ranged weapons, that's what I meant to say. <laughs> so you do have ways to increase that. And again, bleed can be useful here with an apothecary. But the other line, this left whole branch, is really big. So keep in mind, all these are currently limited to one range, right? But if we have that servo skull, we no longer have that. It's any range. And you can really start to soup up your team with warp speed biomancy. Target a knight within one range to gain plus two crit damage for melee attacks and plus one movement speed for two turns. That is going to be crucial if you throw that on one of your interceptors who's about to go in there and do a mess of crit damage anyway. Because if you upgrade this, that's four more crit damage. Remember my other guy, my other interceptor who had an eight? crit damage base that's 12 crit damage then on top of his base weapon damage of six that's 18 damage swinging out from that guy so you really can soup up your dudes with biomancy in such a strong way especially because you can give it any range going down here we have the ability to add resistance now resistance is the ability to shut down any afflictions that are being thrown onto your knights and it is really nice but the nice thing here too about endurance biomancy is it is one of the only ways to do a single target purify otherwise you got to use stuff like a servo skull or a few other random abilities here i think emperor's light has a purify on it or, or maybe that's just with the mutations i can't recall even though we just looked at it two seconds ago but still regardless it's one of the few ways you can purify especially with the apothecary and it's a really nice way to purify because it also gives them resistance so they're going to be less likely to um, get another affliction for two more turns and you can increase that up to three turns if you so wish um, and you can have that uh, boon resistance go up to a total of 50 percent which is very nice but this one is this is a really good ability here for the auto sympathetic biomancy when this knight uses a biomancy he has a 15 percent chance to gain the same boon automatically that is also quite lovely um, especially if you think a bit of more of like endurance biomancy or the other one up here iron arm that'll be nice for him uh warp speed he probably is not going to be running in there and hot and, and chopping things up but just kind of depends on how you how you kit him out maybe maybe you've gone with the bleeding apothecary and you want to have him do some crit damage well you know what you got that option now if you cast it on the character this might kick in keep in mind too it is a 15 percent chance to happen so it is quite low it might need to be buffed with focus items which can be used because you also have this other ability we're going to talk about at the last portion of the apothecary tree in the iron arm diploma or uh, <laughs> iron arm biomancy not, not diplomacy 
So, target knight within one range to gain one stun with melee attacks for one turn. And then you can increase that to have it last for two turns and then have it plus two stun. But this one, when this knight uses a biomancy, has a 50-50 chance to gain one AP automatically. So, if I wanted to make a biomancer, apothecary biomancer, I would beeline for that ability. Um, well, I would get this first, and then I'd be lined for that ability because then I'd be able to just get much more refund or much more value out of each individual biomancy I'm using because that 50 50, it's going to be nice. But I honestly don't find Iron Arm very useful in the beginning portion of the game. You will not be stunning things as much, but as soon as you start to encounter the Mephetic Blight Launchers, you start to encounter, well, I'm actually, they're not as bad, but when you start to encounter Terminators, Demon Princes, a lot of the scarier, bigger things in the game, getting an increase to your stun is very nice. So, while I don't think this is a very crucial beginning game, Biomancy, it's one you will grow into. And I think if you already put the point into it to get to this, the other two points can come later whenever it makes sense for you. Um, but I think that you'll you'll find a lot of use out of Surgical Adept, and the, and the rest will kind of come in, in, in due course. So, if I'm building out an Apothecary, in short, how would I do it? If I was going to be a healer, I'd focus on these three, and then get all four of these. If, and then, also Emperor's Judgment, like ASAP too. I mean, I'd probably get these two, and then Emperor's Judgment, and Immobilized. Like, if, I, if I'm thinking of strictly how I'd spend those points, it'd probably be one, two, three, well... One, two, three, four, five, six. That's how I'd probably do it for, for rank, a brand new rank three apothecary. Then from there, I would go into whatever thing I want to go with, biomancy, whatever it is. The nice thing is that if you have a, a, an old enough apothecary, he can go into a lot of stuff. So if you wanted to go strictly with the biomancer, I would pick up Terminator armor regardless. I'd get still Emperor's Judgment and still probably immobilize and then go into some of my biomancy and pick up that uh, servo skull ability too. Um, because you want that ability to use those biomancies in an unlimited range. But hopefully this helps you out now with building out your Apothecary, a class that seems like it is very straightforward, but is probably the most complex as far as choices and decisions you have to make of the four base classes. And at that, it brings our video here to a close. So hopefully this helps you out in determining what kind of way you want to build out your classes. I didn't want to give you a straight up like, hey, you got to do this, you got to do that, or else it's not going to work, because that's not really the way that Chaos Gate Demon Hunter works. It is very much a build your own adventure, play the game how you want, but there are certain things that I have personally found to be very beneficial to myself. Like I've said, talking about how stun isn't something that's very present in the beginning of the game, but it's something more present in the latter portions of the game. Or uh, dealing with stuff like the... Um, the Incinerator, not as crucial in a lot of engagements, but you'll find it really beneficial if you're playing against boss who will put down something that is going to uh, uh, be on the battlefield that you want to burn away. So, Or Bleeding, another good thing that's really great on the Apothecary, but not so great on everyone else. So as you play through the game, figure out what makes the most sense for you. A lot of your decisions are going to be linked to the talents you get, to the individual loadout and loot that you get. So don't feel like there's a wrong way to build your character. I think that's a, a, something that really happens to a lot of RPG players, a lot of strategy game players with RPG elements, is this notion that I've built my character wrong, I need to respect him immediately, I can't respect right now, it's the end of the world. No. Don't worry about it. You're gonna you're gonna go through plenty of nights, and eventually you will unlock the ability to respec. Just take some time. Learn the things that you don't know. Like if you say like, hey, you know this character's crap. He's got te terrible abilities. Use that character to try out a whole bunch of other abilities that you would not have otherwise tried on a character you want to be like the best apothecary in your team or the best Justicar in your team, whatever it is. Experiment, save, reload, try as many things as you can because that is the only way you'll get better if you are struggling with Chaos Gate Demon Hunter. As I've, as I've found a lot of people are starting to uh, really struggle with the difficulty curve in the game. I don't, I don't know what difficulty I put myself to. I can't find it. <laughs> Probably easy because I'm adult, but still... <laughs> I have a dumb brain, but either way, if you have any questions, you need any help with anything, go ahead and let me know in the comment section below. Always happy to help out my bros. But as always, have a good one and take care.